2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to read today for our message the first four verses. There it is in front of you on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. The Word of God today in the King James text reads, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If you bow your heads with me one more moment today, let's go to the Lord once again. Father, once again we come before you, Lord. The Word of God is open. The bread of life is broken that it might be shared with the people of God. We need that anointing that I sang about. We need that sweet, sweet anointing to be poured out upon us to make us clean like a mighty rushing stream. Master, today let the Word of God go forth with power. Let it go forth with love. Let it go forth with divine authority that the hearer might receive, not just hear, but receive that which the Spirit of Almighty God would speak unto the church at this hour. Touch not only myself, the speaker, but touch as well the hearer. Let every heart today be cultivated, be prepared by the Holy Ghost to receive that which I'm about to speak. Lord, let the seed of your word find good ground that that seed might break forth with roots and it might establish itself a healthy, vibrant plant able to bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' precious, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle Paul said in our primary text today, Verse 3, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians. But if our gospel be hid, or if it be not understood, if, it, it's not, uh, if it's not clearly understood by anyone, he said, it is hid to them that are lost. I've titled my message today, Lost. Sometimes the vocabulary of Christianity confuses and it confounds those who have not embraced the faith of Jesus Christ. We use any number of terms that people who are not in the faith, people who are not part of the church, they hear these terms and they sometimes they make jokes and they poke fun at it. I remember when I was a kid, it was popular for churches to put signs on the building or to put a little phrase under the name of the church that said, Jesus saves. And people would make fun of that and say, well, I'm glad he has a savings account, but I don't know what he's saving for. Because they don't understand the vocabulary of the church. They don't understand that vernacular that we use 
as believers, terms like saved, sinners, even the word fellowship, when you say we're going to have fellowship afterwards, they're like, well, what in the world does that mean? It just means a time of social interaction, you know, uh, a meal and social interaction, but we call it fellowship. We use the term lost, as Paul used in our primary text today, verse 3, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians. We use the term lost and as the people of God, we have come to embrace these terms. We've come to have some ideas to their meaning. And yet often even believers don't fully understand what some of these terms mean and why these terms are used. We use the term lost. We use this word when referring to those who are outside of the faith. Non-believers, non-Christians. And many non-Christians hear us using this word and they say to themselves, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm not lost. I know where I am. But lost in spiritual terms does not refer to a physical location or even a physical state. But rather it refers to a spiritual condition. An individual who is not safely in the Good Shepherd's fold is in effect lost. Some people feel that if they are surrounded by beautiful things or, an ex or exquisite scenery that they can't possibly be lost. Well, I'm in a field of gorgeous flowers. I can't be lost in a field of gold. Well, certainly you can be lost in a field of gorgeous flowers if you don't know how to get out of it and you don't know how to get where you need to go, you're lost. Your environment does not change the fact that you're lost. Some people in this life think, Tommy, that if they can buy enough, if they can have enough, if they can surround themselves with the best of all that life has to offer, that that will somehow change their condition from being lost to kind of being established and knowing where they're at. But honey, you can have all kinds of stuff and still be lost. I think about homeless folk. Here in Dallas, we've had a rush since COVID-19. We've had a, a rush of homelessness in this city. It's sad, really. And it amazes me how there are some homeless people who are pushing around shopping carts. And some of them don't have one. They have two or more. And they're pushing around these shopping carts loaded with all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. But they're still homeless. Mm -hmm. You can have all kinds of stuff. It doesn't mean you've got a home. But it helps them, I suppose, to feel like they're not as destitute and they're not as hopeless and helpless as they might otherwise feel. You know, the more I have, the less I feel like nobody, if you follow what I'm saying. And I see these poor people, bless their hearts, running around with carts full of stuff, but nowhere to put that stuff. Because mm -hmm. no matter how much you have, you still remain Homeless, I'm here to tell you today, my friend. I don't care how much you surround yourself. I don't care how much you drink. I don't care how many drugs you do. I don't care how much sex you have. I don't care how many friends you've got. I don't care how pretty of a house you live in or how nice a car you drive. If you do not know where you are, listen to me, and you do not know where you're going, then you're lost in the spiritual sense of the word. You're lost. Some people don't understand that whether you're in a field of flowers or in a barren desert, 
the truth is lost is lost. But now today in the spiritual sense, lost speaks to the fact that we are unsure of where we are, listen to me now, as it relates to where we want to be. Hmm. See, you're not lost if you know, listen to me carefully now, you're not lost if you know where you are as it relates to where you want to be. But if you don't know how to get from where you are to where you want to be, you're lost. Am I telling the truth? Amen. In a spiritual sense, this also is the case. As children of God, we long to be in the presence of the Lord. We live our lives with the assurance and the hope that one day we will close our eyes in this life and we will open them in eternity. We are not lost because we know where we are going and we are certain that we're on the right road to reach that objective. Hallelujah. An unbeliever often convinces themselves that there is no consciousness after death. And therefore they have no objective. They have no goal. They have no destination. All of their destinations are dependent upon whether or not they wake up tomorrow morning. They have goals. They have objectives. But... Those objectives are dependent upon whether or not their life continues yet another day. One cannot possibly qualify as anything but lost when they have no idea where they are as it relates to where they're going. You can wander the world in a motorhome having no goal, no destination in mind at all. You may say you're not lost because you have all that you need with you. And therefore you're not in need of getting to any particular location or destination. But when you wander about with no idea as to where you are or where you're going, my friend, you can have everything you need with you. You are still lost. Not feeling lost does not mean that you are not lost. That's right. During certain times of the year, some farmers will create a maze in their cornfields. It's challenging. They can be confusing. It's easy for visitors to get lost among the channels that are cut out from the hundreds of rows of corn. I remember as a kid, we had a farm at the top of the, the mountain that we lived on, the Edwards Farm. Mom, you'll remember the Edwards Farm. They used to have a, a fresh fruits and vegetables stand that they operated at their farm. And uh, when they would plant their corn, and that corn can grow pretty high, eight feet higher about, you know, and I remember a time or two, Charlie Edwards, the, the farmer's son, we'd go to the little stand, you know, and he'd let us go out in the cornfield and we could pick our corn off of the, off the stalk. And I remember one time, boy, I saw this ear of corn and it was huge. It was gigantic. Big, I mean, and all I could think was, boy, that must be the bestest, most wonderful uh, ear of corn that ever grew for it to be that big and boy I picked it and I carried it back and Charlie saw it and he kind of laughed and he said uh, you probably think that's the best ear of corn that you've ever seen don't you? I said yeah can't wait to see it he said well how about if I peel it open for you right here and he peeled it open and it was just fungus the whole thing was just chock full of this white fungus just because it looked all big and fluffy didn't mean it was bigger and better. But I'm going to tell you, it wouldn't be too hard 
to get out in that cornfield and lose yourself. It wouldn't be too difficult to get out there. If you got out far enough, you'd have no idea where you were. You'd have no idea how to get back to where you wanted to be. While it may be fun to challenge ourselves and to try to find the way out of such a maze, the fear can become very real when we find ourselves alone and without any idea as to how we might escape our cornstalk confines. Similarly, when we're out in the woods wandering about and suddenly discover that we've lost our sense of direction and we no longer have any idea where we are as it relates to where we want to be or where we want to go. The sense of being lost overwhelms us. I remember Tommy and I I've done it by myself out there too, but we were at the property in Oklahoma one time, and we have about almost eight acres of land out there. And eight acres of land doesn't sound like a lot until you start walking it. We walked to the back of the property, pretty much to the very back line of the property, and the property slopes downward a little bit as you go, and before too long, you've actually gone down a good ways. And we walked down to the back of the property and then it come time to walk back up to the cabin. And we looked and guess what? You cannot see the cabin when there's seven acres or better between you and your destination. We couldn't, we couldn't see the cabin. We couldn't see my pickup. We couldn't see nothing that was the least bit familiar to us. We tried to retrace our steps and to go back pretty much the same way we came. And guess what? We were not finding ourselves anywhere that we recognized. So we kept walking and we kept walking. And after a while, we finally, 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 finally came out to a clearing that I think I, I said, I think I recognize this. This isn't even on our land. We're on somebody else's property now. And boy, I'm telling you, when I think back to how good God's been to us, we don't know how many rattlesnakes could have been in all that tall grass and everything. Because, I mean, the grass was, you know, this high. And here we are. I said, if we go up this way, up uphill, we should reach the road. Once we reach the road, we can make a left and we'll come to our property. And we did that and we found our property finally. But my God, were we lost. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter how pretty the woods were. It didn't matter how beautiful the environment was. It didn't matter how nice the weather was. How much we were enjoying the air. I'm going to tell you the sense of fear and concern that overwhelms you when you find yourself lost. I don't know where I'm going and I don't know how to get there. That fear is very real. I know where I parked my car. I know where my cabin's at as it relates to getting back to civilization. If I could just find one or the other, I'll be okay. Then I can find my way back to civilization because I'm familiar with the route I traveled to get my vehicle to where it was now parked. I want to tell you today, folks, many people in our world today are in fact lost. If they believe that the end of this life is the finality of existence, then they are generally not looking forward to arriving at that destination. I don't know very many people who look forward to getting to the end of this life if they think this life is ending at blackness and darkness and nothing. Don't know very many people that are gleefully headed mm -hmm. in that direction. That may be where they believe they will end up in the end, but few will run toward that goal. And most, in fact, will do all they can 
to steer clear of it instead. As living flesh and blood beings, we've no clue as to when we might reach the end of our natural lives. We may suddenly be taken out by a home gas line explosion, or we may live to a ripe old age and simply die of natural causes. But we have absolutely no knowledge, no sure knowledge at all of when the end will come for us. Without that knowledge, guess what? We're lost. We know our destination, or at least we think we do. But we have no idea when in our journey we may happen upon it. As children of God, our expectation today is very different. We see death as a transition from one state of existence or one state of consciousness to another. We have a hope, we have a belief that once we have transitioned from this life to the next, we will stand forever in the presence of our Creator, our King, our Savior and Redeemer. We are never lost because we know where we're going and we will be glad, hallelujah, when we arrive there. Amen. No matter the timing, no matter the circumstance that may hasten our arrival, I'm here to tell you, 56 years ago, also on a Sunday, this old chubby preacher came into existence. I entered this world 56 years ago today. On a Sunday, I came into this life. I came into this world. Twenty-one years ago, on this day, I was lying in Yona Haven Hospital. The doctors had given me up for dead. They'd been telling my family for weeks and weeks that I had 24 hours to live and they had no expectation whatsoever that I would survive. They had absolutely no expectation whatsoever. I remember on my birthday I was still intubated. I was still hooked up to life support. I still had that... machine sounding in my hearing and without that sound I would not have been breathing because I couldn't breathe on my own I remember the doctors the nurses coming in they had some kind of little cake or something and they had a candle in but they couldn't burn it because I was on oxygen obviously they'd have blown us all to kingdom come if they had tried to burn it but they sang happy birthday to me they were as surprised as I was that I lived even to see my 35th birthday. They were shocked. I was shocked. I had told my mother weeks earlier I wasn't sure that I would live to see my 36th, 35th birthday. I've told this story before, but twice, I won't go into all the details, but twice the Lord questioned me whether or not I wanted to go home or I wanted to stay. And twice I was uncertain. And at first I said, yes, Lord, I want to go home. And I began to feel my spirit. I literally began to feel. It's a sensation that I cannot, I, I can't put words to it. I really can't. It was an amazing, positive, wonderful sensation all of a sudden I felt like I was divorced from all fear all worry all concern all anxiety every negative emotion you could ever imagine I didn't feel not a one of them didn't feel none of it I suddenly felt free of all that and I just felt myself beginning to rise. And then I suddenly remembered the little 
LGBT affirming church I was trying to build in New Haven, Connecticut. And I said, oh Lord, but who are going to... Who's going to be there to take care of these fellas? I don't have anybody. There's nobody ready to take my place. And, and immediately, upon changing my mind, I felt my spirit drop, literally drop, back into my body. And I mean to tell you, honey, you don't realize how heavy your human body is. You don't realize how... You're a spiritual being going through a physical experience. And you don't realize how heavy the baggage is that you carry around every day in the form of your human body. But when you've been separated from your body and then you return to it, all of a sudden, my God Almighty, I was like, oh my Lord, I felt like my body was made out of cement. It, it literally felt heavy to me. My whole body felt heavy to me. And that happened twice. Say, Pastor, why are you sharing that? I'll tell you why I'm sharing that. Because people worry about the end of their journey and they're concerned that I want to be with Jesus. I want to make heaven. I want to see the Lord. But I'm not certain if that moment comes upon me suddenly and I'm not prepared for it. Is there going to be some negative emotional experience that I'm going to have? And I'm here to tell you today, based on my experience, I doubt it. That's why I say, when a believer gets to the end of their road, honey, they're happy. You and I may weep because they left this life in a car wreck. You and I may weep because they left this life in some sort of disaster. You and I may weep because they left this life uh, in response to some sickness or some disease. But I assure you, they are happy to have reached their destination. I assure you, there are no tears in heaven. Hallelujah. They're not as sad and as heartbroken as you are. And I'm not fearful that when my time comes, I'll be afraid or I'll be sad or I'll be. No. Been there. Done that. I know when the time comes that I will be happy. I have finally crossed the finish line. Hallelujah. I remember driving Uber. I had a man one day in my car. And he and I were talking and he said he was going home uh, to see his dad. And about then the phone, his phone rang and he took the call and he began to talk to a family member, somebody. And being in the car, just the two of us, I couldn't help but overhear his side of the conversation anyway. And when he hung up the phone, I, I said to, he said to me uh, something because we kind of were in the middle of a conversation and, and he very immediately went right back to where we were in our conversation, you know. Very, very polite person, you know. And I told him, I said, I can't help but overhear your conversation. And I said, I, I know your dad is on his deathbed. I know that he's a believer. I heard you say all these things. I said, and I know he's in hospice care and they're not expecting him to live a whole lot longer. I said, can I just tell you what I experienced some years ago? And I told him about my experience. We got to the airport and I dropped him at the airport. And he handed me a $40 tip. And he said, Charles, it had to be God that you drove me today to this airport. It had to be God. He said, because your words, what you just told me about your experience uh, at the moment of death, he said, your words have comforted my spirit so much. He said, I know 
that my dad is not going to be sad or he's not going to be heartbroken. He's not going to be troubled. He's not going to be fearful. He's going to be happy that he finally reached his designation. Oh, I want to tell you something today, folks. It is so wonderful not to be lost. It is so wonderful to have some idea where I'm going. It is so wonderful to know that at the end of my journey, I will reach the destination I'm anticipating. Hallelujah. I'm not lost. I may not fully know what I'm going to experience between today and then, but I am not lost. Hallelujah. Because I know where I am going. Those in this life who remain may grieve and mourn when a loved one or a friend has passed into eternity. But the one who has passed, who is not lost, is not at all in a state of sorrow. They're not in a state of mourning. They're not in a state of grief, nor are they disappointed. No, the child of God who has passed into the glory realm is perfectly thrilled and satisfied to have arrived at the destination they long anticipated. Ghost hunters on television love to say that people were taken too soon and therefore they choose to linger here in the earthly realm. But the Word of God informs us that at the hour of death we have only one of two options. And the choice of which option we pursue must be made while we are yet living. We can make prearrangements to either be present with the Lord or to experience the consequence of God's judgment. The Word of God tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Paul said, man, as long as we're in this body, we're absent from the Lord. <laughs> as long as we're in this body, we're not able to be with Jesus. He said, but you know what? We're willing to be absent from the body so that we can be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. That's the difference between, between being lost and being found. When I first contemplated a move to New York City, I'll never forget it, back in... Uh, early uh, 1990 I first visited my friend who lived there and one day I went into Manhattan on the subway to look into you know maybe finding some work I'd never been on a subway in New York by myself before uh, I was not at all well versed in the subway system or even Manhattan in general or the city in general when I got off the train and made my way up the stairs to the sidewalk above, I began to look around at all the high buildings, myriad of buildings and multitudes of people passing me by. I took a few steps from the subway exit and was instantly gripped by a sense of terror. Talk about fear. I realized it wouldn't take much for me to go too far from this subway entrance and I'd be lost. After all, I only knew how to get back to my friends 
house via this one specific subway train. And the only station I was familiar with was the one at West 4th Street. I didn't understand yet all the intricacies of the New York City subway system. I didn't realize there were subway stops at all kinds of streets along the way and that I could easily connect from one train to another, you know, and get back where I needed to go. I didn't understand how all that worked. I hadn't ever used the subway system on a regular basis. I didn't know that several blocks away along the same avenue there were more and more subway entrances leading to the same train which could take me back to the same point of origin. I was lost and it terrified me. I was surrounded by thousands of people and hundreds of businesses and buildings and yet I was lost. Why was I lost? Because I didn't know what I needed to know to, comfort to comfortably navigate my way around this massive metropolis. I could ask others for directions, but I did not personally possess the knowledge necessary to do what I needed to do without the help of a stranger or a phone call to my friend. I didn't have a cell phone back then. Very few people did for that matter. I turned right back around and went straight back down those steps into the subway and boarded the next train for the only destination with which I was familiar in Brooklyn. Just because I was surrounded by crowds of people and all kinds of life and activity, I was not comfortable. Even so today, my friend, many in our world are caught up in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and yet they are fearful and anxious. They may know where they are, and they may even know where they want to go, but what they don't know is whether an open manhole or a sinkhole might open up and swallow them, suddenly ending their journey and leading them to a destination that they are not certain of. You can know where you are. You can know where you started and where you're going. God has made the way for us to understand the mysteries of life. He's also made a way for us to navigate this life with peace in our hearts and joy in our soul. Hallelujah. He's provided a means whereby we might spend all of eternity with Him free from all the pain and the emotional issues that are related to this life. It is called the way of faith. Believers walk by faith and not by sight. And in so doing, we have assurance that whenever we're suddenly called to our final destination, even if unexpectedly and far sooner than we have anticipated, we will be pleased. And we will forever be satisfied like the old Gospel song says that I love so much. Everybody will be happy over there. Hallelujah. Won't be anybody in heaven who isn't happy to be in heaven. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you in Psalm chapter 17, verse 15, my favorite passage in the Word of God. I have said many times that I know on tombstones they charge by the letter, but if the money is available, this is the passage I'd love on my tombstone. It says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Oh, listen to me, folks. I want you to understand today, you need not be alone to be lost. Mm -hmm. 
You may even take comfort in the fact that although you are lost, at least you are lost having others with you. You also do not have to be miserable or, unpleasant, uh, or in unpleasant surroundings to be lost. Lost in a field of sunflowers is no less lost than one's being surrounded by desert sands. The God of all heaven wants you to know today that while you may be lost, you are not without a Savior. He's looking for you. Finding your way today is not entirely upon your shoulders. The Lord understands that not everyone will give us good directions or clear instruction. He knows that in our world there are those who may mean us well and there are others who may do us harm. Mm -hmm. For this reason he himself is always on the lookout for that lost soul. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. He sees you today in your lost state. He understands your confusion and your anxiety. He is reaching out toward you in hopes that you will respond in kind and make your way toward Him. For in Luke chapter 19 verse 10, Jesus declared, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Amen. So I just had to give you a little word of exhortation today. Whether you be a believer, whether you be a non-believer, I want you to understand what it means to be lost. And I'm here to tell you today, you have the opportunity. God is as much looking for you as you ever could be looking for Him. And the Lord wants you to be found. He wants you to be safe. He wants you to be in a place where He can protect you and guide you and guard you. Amen. He wants you to be a sheep in His fold so that as the Good Shepherd, He can look out for your well-being. Oh, Master, today we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, God, today for the Word of God. We're grateful, Lord, that you've allowed us today to become children of God. You've allowed us today, Lord, to believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ that we might be saved. And Master, today we're able to say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Glory to God, Master, in Jesus' name. Let's sing today. In closing, that marvelous old hymn, everybody knows it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Thank you. 
if you bow your heads with me today as we close our service. This was a very simple word of exhortation today. It was not a fancy sermon. Just a little reminder. Just a call to those who maybe don't know the Lord yet. This church preaches unapologetically the full apostolic plan of salvation. If you ask the question today, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to no longer be lost, but to be sure of my destination so that I can have peace at whatever hour, at whatever moment, whatever time, God decides to call me home. My answer is the same as the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are afar off, many as the Lord our God shall call and I'm here to tell you today you're among that number even as many as the Lord our God shall call so I invite you today to believe on Jesus obey his gospel put feet on your faith enter the waters of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and then prepare your heart to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God wants you to have it. He wants you to be full of His love. He wants you to be full of His grace. Most importantly, He wants you to be full of His power. So that you can make it through this life and keep your faith intact.